13th. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. It's Trump week. And this week, like last week and the week before, is full of uh, bumps and surprises. This week, the title of the show is Trump Gets a Trini Bar to Drop Charges Against Michael Flynn. How about that? Um, Winston, welcome. Stephanie, welcome. Welcome to Trump week. Aloha. Well, without further ado, let's jump right into it. Um, the Department of Justice has dropped charges against Michael Flynn. I was taken back from that, um, along with 2,000 other uh, prosecutors and DOJ employees that have signed a letter stating that w William Barr should resign from his position. Uh, that's quite a feat. Uh, I think they tried it before when um, uh, William Barr tried to intercede about the sentencing guidelines for Roger Stone. So here we go again. Uh, General Barr, Trump's dutiful lackey taking taking the doj in a direction where it has probably no business going in that direction uh winston your your initial thoughts about this um you know robert wright came out with something and he says i cannot overstate the gravity of this gross miscarriage of justice and how dangerous this is for our democracy's future michael flynn is getting zero jail time for lying to the fbi undermining prosecutors and betraying the country um meanwhile attorney general Barr has turned the Justice Department into nothing more than a political tool for Trump to wield against his enemies and withdraw against his friends. This is how dictatorships are built. I, you know, the president has pardon powers in the Constitution. We understand that his friends, if this is a federal crime, that he's going to he's going to uh, get them pardoned or released with his powers. That part, I think, as bad as that might have been. We can take that, but when the Justice Department is being used like this as a tool, instead of the, the Justice Department as the head of justice for the country, this is the head of justice for Donald Trump. And it's a very different matter and very dangerous uh, precedent. And will, will we ever get back to the Justice Department when you have 2,000 former Department of Justice employees saying, what? Um, my question was, why didn't, why didn't every single one of them say, what? So it, it's not good, no matter how you slice it or dice it. Well, Judge Sullivan, um, he now is looking at uh, allowing an amicus brief, which is to say a brief from the friends of the court, and allowing a group called the Watergate Prosecutors to submit a brief about why this isn't a great idea. So it'll be interesting to see what Judge Sullivan does with that uh, upon review and whether that uh, influences his decision. I know that... Uh, Trump followers are not happy about it, and they say this is unusual and this shouldn't be allowed. Well, look at all the unusual things in the last three and a half years that have taken place that Donald Trump has instituted, and now they're getting upset because it's not proper protocol. My goodness. Uh, Stephanie, what do you think about all this business? It's just not proper protocol. Well, ah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, I think at all the levels of analysis that you can apply to this, I mean, at the first level, is um, Donald, will you do your work? He's not doing any work. He hasn't done any work. Nothing has been done. As the work on the plate before you in the timeline of now and then anticipating other things. So right there, you've got a problem. That's not happened. Then the next sets of levels are um, his interference and distraction of himself and everybody else from the work of now. So um, I think that uh, it's outrageous and all of those, and certainly bringing in the Watergate prosecutors and people have stature and reputations and integrity to say these things. We've already done this a couple of times. I think it ought to go on the record. I think the record is the most important thing that needs to be maintained and continued and built. But I'm wondering if, you know, he's gonna just have to be let run. Let, let the leash go, because the Supreme Court's going to come in. 
with that ruling, that'll be the next uh, unprecedented if they come down and say, no, he can't have any legal constraints on him during the presidency. I, I just think that'll be the last straw. I mean, we're- yeah, But Stephanie, just, let's look at this. He's breaking the rule of law, if you will, in so many different areas. And if we always have to wait for a su Supreme co Court ruling, we're almost you know, at the end of his presidency, the first term. So basically this president gets away with stretching the constitution into a pretzel and breaking the rule of law all the while while we have to wait for a, 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 a court decision. Um, where is our legislature? Where is the, the Senate? Where is the House of Representatives on this? I mean, this is the thing is we can't, nothing is working. So the ruling from the Supreme Court is June, evidently July, that's coming out then. Um, but I think we really ought to put all of our energies, every, every attention into making the election happen and making the election happen correctly and according to democratic principles. Let, because there's nothing to do about all of the rest of this. There's, uh, he's going to continue this, this continu continual uh, throwing things around and messing everything up and running from one pile to the next pile of, of yeah that he's created i think maybe it's going to get to that let, let it go and then yeah, let's... i get that i get that but this is blatant cronyism uh I... look at paul manafort uh he's just been released because of fears of covid19 infection might come his way i don't know a whole lot of other prisoners are getting a free pass on this why okay. paul manafort well i want to just say one more thing and that's that there's no uh limits on the time i mean we're um, after his, if he is tossed out of office, then I think the Southern District of New York and all the other places where a lot of work is happening on building these cases. And then I think it'll close in on him. And that gets taken care of at all of these other layers of the government, the state, and maybe the feds are going to do the Justice Department. I don't know what'll happen, but that just needs to be pushed off uh, I mean, that is not going to happen now, no matter what, yeah. no matter how good the work there. So let's just assume that, that he's going to get taken care of in the aftermath because he can't be taken care of. A big assumption, if, Stephanie, if a big assumption. Aftermath, if there's no out of office. So yeah. the, the, mo the most important thing is to drop it and just get the election under control. Well, this is the first news topic in a long time that didn't deal with COVID-19. And so... Um, it was it was surprising and shocking to me to see this blatant attempt to show uh, cronyism and favoritism and and use the attorney general who is the top cop of this country as his personal his personal fixer. And they uh, let's let's move on. Let's move on to the death toll of politics. And uh, recently, Donald Trump said about six days ago about testing. He goes uh, in a way uh, by testing this makes us look bad. So. <laughs> Right now, our death toll is exceeding 85,000 Americans. Um, he's using China as a scapegoat. And it's, let's get these businesses open faster than not, regardless of what the science says, regardless of, of how many more cases will develop and out of those cases, how many more deaths may entail. Um, Winston, are you kind of shocked? I brought, the, brought this up last week. Are you kind of shocked or surprised that the death toll really doesn't mean a whole lot. And no matter what the number is, Donald Trump thinks he is successful with whatever uh, his approach is, despite whatever the death toll is. Winston. I mean, they're doing a fabulous job. Everything's perfect and nothing to look at here, folks. There, there can be differences of opinion on how to open up this economy, on when to open up, where to open up, how to close back down. I'm, there's no direction from the federal government. And when the CDC has effectively been muzzled or is uh, sidelined or forced to maybe not be a scientific organization anymore, um, or inside of this COVID task force, when you have the president and the vice president refusing to wear masks even because, I don't know, they're afraid of not looking manly or that, that, that there's an actual epidemic and they need to do that when they go to a hospital or a factory. There's no plan coming from the top, and Donald Trump has just scattered this to the states and said, okay, good luck with whatever it is you guys do, because it's your responsibility, and you need to open up, but if you need uh, respirators or masks or whatever, it, that's all on you. So yeah. uh, don't come looking to me for advice, direction, or anything, except glory, because I'm right, and we're making everything perfect, 
And if you have a problem with it, take it up with your Democratic governor. Yeah. Well, you know, the CDC has been muzzled, but guess what? Um, Dr. Fauci has not. And as you know, he testified in front of the Senate yesterday. Um, people thinking that, well, he's in safe grounds with the Senate because they're going to give him, you know, softball questions. But I don't think that was the case. I saw a lot of Republican senators really kind of uh, throwing questions and getting answers and supporting those answers about the dangers of opening up too quick. Uh, as you know, Donald Trump didn't want him to, to do any testimony in front of the, the, the House of Representatives. He thought the Senate was a, a better, safer bet. But Dr. Fauci directly opposed what Donald Trump is trying to push. And that is, let's take caution, let's be careful before we open these uh, businesses up without a lot of thinking about it. Uh, did you happen to catch any of the testimony from Fauci yesterday? I did. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because he never mentioned the word Donald Trump or the words Donald Trump once. He didn't say this administration, I don't believe. I think he, he said things in a very general way from a scientific perspective. He's, he's very um, adept at dancing around that. And we still are looking at him as the adult in the room to, to have some guidance and some, um, some sanity in all of this. So, you know, again, I think we have to look at our own governors who are hopefully sane and business leaders but the problem is is that we're getting then just flagrant violations of, of rule of law you have you know elon musk starting up his factory when it is against the law and he's been encouraged to do this by the the head of the country that violate the law in your state along with with, with, with folks showing up with uzis at state houses this is the real problem is that when you have a, a president encouraging you know active dissent even to the point of it uh you know being really very threatening how do you have a country of rule of law then how do we when when we're told you're making your own rules and do what you like how does that work in a country of rule of law i mean that's my basic well question. it's not only a rule of law winston but i i must be having amnesia because i could have sworn about two or so weeks ago it was donald trump and the, the administration's idea that before businesses would open, they quote unquote would follow the science first. And they're not even finishing the, the first protocol of that, which is to say that you would have consecutive number of days of, of falling cases. Uh, and a, a lot of these southern according, That's a science according to chief scientist Donald Trump. And there you go. He that uh, whatever it is that, uh, of his recommendation, because he's got, you know, whatever it was, he said, really smart up there. Yeah, so the, the science is based on today it's injecting bleach, tomorrow it's, um, uh, you know, opening up, whatever. It's chloroquine. <laughs> Tomorrow's chloroquine. So, chloroquine, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Stephanie, is, is Donald Trump starting to look a little ghoulish uh, in his, his praise of what a great job is being done, yet the death count continues to rise and – again, like a, like a great tree litter that he professes himself to be, is he looking a little ghoulish saying that, you know, mission accomplished, job well done? Uh, and, and those who support his, his blind rush to get the businesses open, are they also starting to look a little ghoulish? And is that going to eventually uh, impact them come election time? I, I appreciate your saying that. It, it, it is to that degree, Tim. I think it is there and, and uh, people, I certainly, if we think it, at some point, the rest of the humans on the planet must be thinking it too, with a few exceptions, I'll admit can be there. But I think that's really a good point. And this is maybe one of those places where it's gonna turn around on him because of his, his already noted uh, death lab, lack of any empathy. I also thought Dr. Fauci, Fauci was magnificent in his response to um, Dr. Uh, Ron Paul, um, that senator. I, I'm, I, I was appalled, again, we've been saying that over and over, it's like a chant, that, that Ron Paul would criticize him and call him an egomaniac for, for saying Well, you said you are the, the end degree, or so, in so many words, you said you're the, you, we need to stop acting like you're the, uh, the end authority or the end degree of, of how we approach this. And, I liked, I did like Dr. Fauci's response. Yeah, I didn't know what he said. Maybe he meant the nth degree in the T. Yes, the nth degree, yes. Like that, but yeah, and but Fauci, um, Dr. Fauci has such a stature and dignity and came back and said what he is. 
And that was exactly what he said he was. Now, nobody else would be, very few others would be asking him that question. But to hear someone as educated and knowledgeable as Ron Paul is ha reveal that kind of an attitude towards Fauci, when what Fauci said is certainly true. He doesn't, he's not contradicting to, to come up and, and, and grandstand. He just is repeating the fact, the, the data. So anyway, I... I think that uh, he's dependable, uh, Dr. Fauci is, in all the ways that Ron Paul thinks he's not, right? I mean, he will get up there, do his medical duty, uh, you know, do no, do no harm and, and try to get the, the best to happen. for. Are, are, are the governors of various states, particularly those, some of those in the southern states, by following Donald Trump's wishes and desires, are they throwing themselves in, in political jeopardy? I, I, I say that because I look at some polls right now, and right now, Governor of California, Newsom, has an 80% support on not rushing into the opening of business prematurely, where if you look at the governor of Georgia, uh, I believe that name, um, Brian Kemp, he is um, faltering around 35% of, um, of approval for his attempts to get things opened up early. Uh, is this going to follow those governors? and maybe even other, uh, other politicians of that state that have uh, attached themselves to Trump on, this, on his wish list here. You think that's gonna happen? I think there's a star of that show, which is that the one, is she Michigan, that she came to the White House to be with Trump and Pence, and, and now they're all quarantined because Pence was positive. But she's the one that while she sat on the Diaz or in the Oval Office with Trump and Pence, her, her Cases were rising, um, notably uh, back in the state, because they have a meatpacking plant and some other places that she's been unwilling to address. And so I think she is, I mean, I'm apologizing for not ha having the name on the tip of my tongue, but that, that would be someone yeah. who's going to be clearly impacted, if they're going to be impacted at all. Things have gotten so crazy, that is why in my previous remarks, I'm not dropping my analysis of this as it goes along and, and uh, the unprecedented nature of all of it and the outrageousness of it. I'm just saying that it's going to culminate in him getting reelected if we don't pay attention like, to what's really important. And that's one of his ploys is get all these fires going. So we're all running around and they call them shiny objects right on the TV. Or, ch or cable. Well, I say drop, you know, don't go with that. Let's just go with the one thing we want, which is a democratic, fair, working election. Uh, yeah. Because hey. we're over. We've all got to get the boats. Good, all the boats good, are good point, boats. Stephanie. I'm going to throw a question here at um, Winston. Winston, we got a question coming over the line here, and that is, how many administrations has Dr. Fauci worked for? Uh, this isn't a trivia question. But um, I'm going to direct that towards you. Do you have Do you have a sense of how many administrations he's worked for in his well, current role? He was He was right at the very start of the HIV crisis, and so that was uh, let's see, do Ronald Reagan, George Bush Senior, uh, Clinton, George Bush Junior, uh, who was after him, uh, Obama. Thank you, and now Donald Trump. So uh, Bing, 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 winner. <laughs> Okay, that's correct. <laughs> and you know, th that's the thing. I think what Stephanie was saying really deserves to be underscored because what is the end goal here is to confuse and dazzle and stun people on as many different fronts as possible. It's like a fire starter and you have, okay, there's one building burning. Okay, you can take care of one building burning. You can take care of a district burning, but when you're starting fires throughout the entire city, Good luck with that one. And that's exactly what's happening here. We're going to be looking at challenges on voting on every single thing we've already heard. Of. We're shutting down the post office or voting by mail is not secure or electronic voting. There will be things at the last second where certain governors say, we're not counting these votes because they happened on a you know Tuesday after 12. I, I, I don't know, what, whatever they're going to come up with. But the end result will be, this is not a valid election. I am therefore the, the emperor for life. And I, we, I am calling on my people to defend freedom. And that's what the end well, analysis- I, I understand is. the concept of defending freedom. And, and you're right, I, with your earlier comment in the show was, there is a balance somewhere of, between opening businesses and being smart as it pertains to uh, 
preventing the transmission of COVID-19. So there is a balance in there somewhere. Uh, the problem is with all the bravado that Donald Trump has provided and the governor's adopting the bravado and then the, their state health inspectors are adopting the bravado, they're moving blindly forward. And now we're starting to see um, more cases, more deaths in those states that are just moving ahead quickly and fast and opening up without a lot of forethought into uh, trying to prevent the transmission of the, the virus. So the question is, will this come back up? When I mentioned this last week, will this come back to bite them as the death tolls rise in those states? Yeah, uh, you know, if they're, I, I, I think more important, is will it come back to bite uh, Donald Trump? And I would say, no, there's nothing that he can do. His, let's remember news, I think it was Newsweek and CNN both did a poll today. He is at all time high, record 49% are approving of his job performance at this point, which is astounding to me. This is a parallel universe that we're dealing with. There are the people that are saying, what are you talking about? And then the other people that think that we're absolutely delusional. My question is, how do we get beyond this in November, assuming that there is a, a resemblance of, of uh, an election, a semblance of an election that is free and fair, where his opponent wins, wins clearly and plainly for um, observers from Guatemala and the Congo and, um, you know, Indonesia say this was a free and fair election. How do well, we get beyond this then and say, what, how do we, how do we have a common truth as Americans going yeah. forward? Winston, I understand parallel universes, believe me, and we've been in one for three and a half years, but let's throw out a hypothetical if I may. Let's say I, you know, my family's in Georgia and they're moving ahead with opening things up and, um, my family goes into the malls or they go into the restaurants and they're shoulder to shoulder. They may or may not have masks on. And um, we believe in Donald Trump and what he says and, and therefore we support him wholeheartedly. What if, my, what if my parent, my grandparent contracts the virus and dies? Am I still gonna be flag waving for Donald Trump? Or is, is that a, was that a justice, justified sacrifice that the President of the United States may continue his reign I, uh, yes. In the end analysis, it won't be blamed on the restaurants opening. It will be blamed on, I don't know, the democratic, uh, socialist, Nazi, Chinese conspiracy to unseat Donald Trump. I, I mean, uh, at the and, end. And they won't see that as my, my direct family member has, has died and succumbed to this virus. And there will be no finger pointing at either the governor or Donald Trump. I don't see it when, when you, when you have had healthcare benefits cut, um, in states where this directly affects the people and then they say, oh, well, you know, uh, Obamacare being cut, lack of Medicaid expansion, uh, Medicare expansion, what, whatever it is, uh, not Medicare, Medicaid, how do you, and you can't pin that back on exactly who's doing that to you uh, through stated policies. Uh, the, 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 the wrecking ball that this administration has been, people are not, there's a cognitive disconnect. They are not connecting any of these actions with the government, even if it's affecting them personally, I just don't see it, whether it goes through death or not. Um, wow. This, you realize that's quite a statement. Uh, it, it, it feels like it to me. You have people that are not connecting the fact that if they go out in these groups right now with a highly infectious disease and they bring it home and one of their relatives dies, that they are, they understand, they can read the newspapers they have. They know that other states are wearing masks but they're still going out and doing it because they're not making the connection that they will bring it home, even though they may have read that. So there is just like so many other things, it's a, such a cognitive disconnect. I don't see, um, I don't see people making the connection and, and assigning any uh, responsibility or blame uh, to the administration. Okay. Thank you, Winston. I'm gonna switch gears here for a minute. Stephanie, um, yesterday the Supreme Court was entertaining um, the case of whether or not Donald Trump's tax returns should be uh, should be released. This all goes into the point about subpoenas, and at least from the questions asked by the court, the Supreme Court justices, uh, they didn't seem to be buying the argument that Donald Trump is beyond approach and uh, sub subpoenas, whatever they are, are nothing more than a nuisance and certainly not worth the time of the president or the administration to have to comply with. Uh, is he going to win the day on that one? Now, I know sometimes court, Supreme Court justices, they ask questions just to ask the questions on the other side, and that doesn't necessarily indicate how they're going to vote. 
But um, how do you think this one might go? How do you think the Supreme Court is going to respond to to what degree does the administration comply with um, subpoenas? And or if not through the, the House of Representatives, certain the Southern District of Manhattan. Well, I, I think that, um, that the legal eagles, the, the experts, uh, several of them were on and they, they don't see it as any clear win for Trump. In fact, it's, he's looking very weak. The argument is weak. And that they saw that was reflected in the kinds of questions that were asked by the justices. But your point is so good, Tim, because these things are, you know, tweaking the tiger and, you know, playing the devil's advocate. You don't know what their own. And then of course, afterwards, they have to come around for, to work, the justices all work to try and get as much unanimity into their decisions as they possibly can, if it's possible at all. So they do work hard. That's why there's such a, a, a long time before we hear their, their findings, because they are trying to come up with a comprehensive uh, response to that. But according to those experts, uh, and especially with those previous three cases, including one like in 1805, where they ruled against this too. So they um, have definitely a history that's not in their favor and, and the case is looking weak. And to the other, the other, and if whatever that comes out, it will just, um, you know, start out with, you know, the, the justice is not paying uh, homage to uh, Trump, blah, blah, and all of that. But, and that's going to come from all of these people that you're questioning how it is that they understand what's going on. And I continue to question that, and I'm glad you brought it up. But I guess I'm coming to the conclusion that one of the answers to that question is that these people are finally in power. These people, meaning the people and the uneducated people, the, by that I mean the non-college group, these people who haven't really had a voice, don't feel like they've had a voice in the governing of the nation and have really kind of been considered stupid and you know not really on top of it. And uh, so they finally, with this administration, have a foot in the door. Yeah, and no, I, I, I understand that. And and, you know, that's how Donald Trump got elected in the first place, I think. So, um, you know, a lot of people just hadn't voted for a long time and felt they were left out of the equation. And, you know, the Democrats had a part in that. They, they for a certain degree, forgot about middle America. And they were criticizing, you know, the, the, you know, the, the country music crowd. And, and you know what? They're, they're an important part of our, our nation. And, and I think they've learned their lesson. So let me move on to uh, Winston. We're almost out of time here, Stephanie. Um, oh. Winston... Go ahead. Uh, Winston, um, what do you think What do you think the Supreme Court is going to do? Are they going to find a middle ground? Are they going to find a, a middle territory on uh, what su uh, subpoenas the administration will and will not have to respond to? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Uh, there's been so much precedent that says that, 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 that a sitting president is not immune to uh, these types of cases, especially a uh, criminal case. Now, we don't want a, a, a president to have be hit with frivolous lawsuits, certainly. But when the, the president is tweeting out a hundred, over a hundred tweets on Mother's Day, you can hardly say that he doesn't have the time to devote to, um, to a lawsuit. And he has a fleet of lawyers. There. So, you know, these are serious allegations. And, you know, it should be stressed, no one takes joy uh, that, that Donald Trump is, is not representing the best interest of all Americans as seen by half the people. We want a president that unifies people, that comforts people, that brings uh, gravitas and, uh, and respect to the Oval Office. Nobody wants that more, I think, than, than uh, the people who have been seeing him and not acting in those capacities. I would love to see him step up to the plate and say, I represent all Americans. I'm going to do the best by you rather than by me. What, what's, what's, in, what's in it for, the, for Donald Trump? That's not what's important here. It's what's important for the nation. And uh, all these distractions are, are just that. We have a very serious problem right now. The economy is collapsing. There's a major pandemic. There's basic issues of our constitutionality at, at play. We need... Donald Trump to just say, let me be the president of the United States for what all of the people need, not just the people who voted for me. And um, it's not going to happen, but it, was, it would be something that I would love to see. All righty. You get the last word on that, Winston. It's, uh, our time has, has come up. 
Thank you very much for joining us. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us on Trump Week. I'm Tim Apicella, your host. Please join us next week, Wednesday, 11 o'clock for Trump Week. Much aloha to everyone.